While people often attribute the renaissance of comic book movies to the likes of DC and Marvel, ranging from successes like Donner's Superman to Burton's Batman to Raimi's Spider-Man to Redacted's X-Men, but it's easy to overlook the low-budget 90s film that skyrocketed to success by bringing a heartfelt, fun, and faithful adaptation of the beloved, dark and gritty indie comic. Spawn! Nah, just kidding. Turtle Power! T-U-R-T-L-E Power! T-U-R-T-L-E Power! T-U-R-T-L-E Power! See these beauty Ninja Turtles! TMNT Spring from Humble Beginnings is a parody of grim and gritty Frank Miller-esque comics by two guys who just like drawing turtles. And then hit the big time as a wildly popular animated series and a massive toy line by Playmates. So the next natural conclusion was to take the turtles to the big screen, because for some reason we've built up a mentality that art isn't valid unless it's a live action two hour theatrically released movie and all other storytelling mediums are somehow inferior. And it doesn't even count unless the movie is live action. You'd think taking the turtles back to their slightly dark and gritty roots as opposed to the light and colorful world of the animated series would be a huge risk. The target audience for turtle content became mostly kids watching Saturday morning cartoons. Would getting into the violent and over-the-top storyline of the comics alienate them? Apparently not, because everyone fucking loved this movie. And there's plenty of reasons to. I hadn't seen it in years before doing this video, but I was shocked just how tightly this script adapts several issues of the comics back-to-back -back into one cohesive three-act movie. Even the Raphael solo issue became a handful of scenes at the beginning. They didn't have to include Casey Jones, but thank Christ they did because he's a really cool character and everything outside of the weird Duke Nukem version of him from the 80s show. So that's your game, is it? Well, mine's mudslinging. This guy is starting to get on my nerves. I think without this movie, a really strange, warped version of that character might have stuck around, or maybe, like, he would have never caught on to begin with. Now, a word from our sponsor. Special thanks to today's sponsor, Established Titles. Established Titles is a project based on historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds, or lords and ladies in English. They allow you to buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land so you can be an official lord or lady. What would you do with one square foot of land? Plant a tree on it! Established Titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. Your square foot of land will be on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and you'll receive an official certificate with a crest. Your certificate features a unique plot number in which you can see the exact location of your land and tree. Established Titles will plant a tree with every order and will work with global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support reforestation worldwide. And because you're a lord or lady, you can change your name to that on documents like credit cards, plane tickets, or dating profiles if you think it'll help your chances. It makes a great last minute gift. I actually got one for my dad and my sister. They even have couple packs that come with adjoining plots of land. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my Mendoza family plot within a few minutes of walking distance. Depending on how many of you want to become our lord or lady, we can build a little Godzilla Mendoza kingdom. Established Titles is actually running an early Black Friday sale. Plus, if you use the code GMZILLA, you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com forward slash GMZILLA to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Now, back to the video. Being that I'm a massive fan of the 2003 cartoon, I feel like this movie informed a lot of how that show adapted the comics. The voice cast and character designs remind me a lot of this one, too. Even this voice for Raphael sort of became the default instead of the more sarcastic and underplayed version from Rob Paulson. A Jose can say go bat! Tell me! You didn't pay money for this. The only concessions I felt they made in terms of the characters was making April a yellow wearing news reporter and giving the turtles their personalities and color schemes from the cartoon. However, these little touches were important for bridging the gap between fans of the cartoon and fans of the comic, and it helps to make the turtles more distinct and likable characters. Before you get the wrong idea, I don't dislike the 80s cartoon at all. I wore out the VHS tape of several episodes as a kid just like the rest of you white guys. I just think the way it adapted the characters came dangerously close to, like, ruining them forever, but then somehow accidentally made them more interesting and transcendent than they ever could have been because they were all just, like, the red angry one. It's a delicate balance that that cartoon struck, and ultimately I'm super thankful that show contributed all the things that it did, even if I prefer a lot of the other versions of the Turtles story. 
Think of it like the 80s show is a really good seasoning that makes every other TMNT thing better. You want to salt these fries, but you never want to just eat salt by itself. Speak for yourself. I'm shoveling salt down my throat right now. One day I'll sit down and finally watch the entirety of that show to give it a fair shake. I feel like sometimes I'm too hard on it because the 2003 show and the Mirage comics rotted my brains too much. Maybe I'm a hack and the 80s Turtles is actually superior. But anyway, Movie Turtles managed to strike a really solid middle ground between grimdark schlock and cartoony toy commercials that makes it a really impressive movie. And the Turtles themselves are so perfectly handled in this film. The way they were brought to live action by Jim Henson's Creature Shop with elaborate costumes, animatronics, puppeteering, and pretty intense body acting is so satisfying to see. They never feel like actors trapped in clunky costumes. Their movements are natural and comfortable, and their faces are believable and expressive. Even if there's some blink and you'll miss it nightmare fuel when they open their mouths too wide in some shots. After a while, I started to forget these were guys in costumes and just saw... Yeah, that's Leonardo. Hey, it's Raphael. The first movie ended up being the last project that Jim Henson personally worked on before his passing, and the team behind this movie were incredibly thankful for his contributions, and they knew they wouldn't have had the same film without him. Yeah, I went out to dinner with, with, with Jim uh, after that, and we drove past a movie theater, and we actually saw one of the ushers come out, and at a certain point, he had to tell them that they weren't going to get in, and man, we saw the emotion. But what are a set of heroes without a villain? This movie's take on the Shredder is intimidating, cold, cunning, and badass. Instead of the goofy version of him from the cartoon, they decided to go a more Darth Vader route, and it worked out. Rather than the Foot Ninja being unnamed Shredder loyalists or exploding robots, the Foot Clan are made up of all the city's wayward youth and troubled teens. Shredder has been silently collecting, recruiting, training, and radicalizing at-risk youths to turn them into the ultimate unseen criminal organization. This is played a little tragically, and it often shows that these kids becoming his soldiers aren't all bad people. They're just lost or struggling to find a place for themselves. We see the son of April's boss at the news station, Danny, getting roped into this gang and the sort of manipulative rhetoric that Shredder spews to keep these boys in line. You are here because the outside world rejects you. This is your family. I am your father. He may not have a world domination master plan or a secret doomsday weapon or a brain and a robot that he hangs out with or anything crazy like that, but he has an entire generation of New Yorkers under his thumb. And the stakes of this story come from stopping him from corrupting anyone else around the same age as the Turtles. I like that more mature take on the Foot Clan, and it makes them feel more unique as an antagonistic enemy force than your usual stormtroopers or other army-building bad guy units. The other biggest core element of the movie comes from the Turtles facing the really daunting situation of potentially losing Master Splinter, and having to guide themselves without him. It harkens back to that scary feeling when you're a teenager and you realize soon you'll be out on your own without your parents telling you what to do or where to go. At first, it can seem enticing to have that much freedom, but it's also taking away a lot of familiarity and comfort that you had when you were younger. The idea of being without their dad is something Splinter tries to prepare them for. And Michelangelo waves it off when asked about it by Donnie later. And once they're confronted with that reality later in the film, Mikey's the one who we see taking it the hardest because he was in denial of that possibility. These touches make the Turtles feel like real teenagers, and that's something I don't think the cartoon or the comic had successfully done by this point. It's a story about putting them on the precipice of adulthood, and their bond as brothers being the only thing that pulls them through all that uncertainty in that time. It's what they have that these other kids in the Foot Clan don't. It's a supportive family keeping them from falling down the wrong path when they have to make their own decisions for the first time. The movie is also carried by its human lead, April O'Neil, played by Judith Hogue. She has a lot of great chemistry and interactions with the Turtles, and she really feels like their friend and like she gets them, and it just makes everything feel a lot more like cozy and fun for the first half. And this version of April also has really good chemistry with Casey, too, which, like, kind of didn't go anywhere, but, you know, it was supposed to. Sure, the movie has some kick-ass fight scenes because they filmed it in Hong Kong with a few well-trained martial artists donning the suits, it sure has some really awesome puppeteering and practical effects that still hold up pretty well, but the biggest strength of this movie 
was just a really mature and heartfelt script that took the material seriously and treated the turtles and their world like real people, rather than just silly cartoon characters. And then the movie made a shit zillion dollars and broke all independent movie records in its time, which only made the cartoon bigger, and then which meant more toys, and then like a bunch of video games, and there's uh, so much money. So naturally, they made a sequel where they threw all that out the window. Immediately, things got shaken up with the cast that makes this movie feel more disconnected from the first. The original April O'Neil actress, Judith Hogue, was let go from the first movie. Her theory was because the producers thought she complained too much while filming the first one. The new actress for April really isn't as compelling in the role. Corey Feldman was unavailable at the time to voice Donnie since he was having some personal struggles with addiction. They recast Raphael's voice actor with someone who actually sounds pretty much the same, so I didn't notice until I saw the cast list. And Casey Jones is nowhere to be found for this whole movie! For some reason, we do have a new character in Kino, a martial artist and pizza delivery guy that ends up bumping into the Turtles and April. He's actually played by Ernie Reyes Jr., who was the stunt performer and body actor for Donatello in the first movie. Apparently the crew and producers loved him so much they wanted to give him a human character to play. And I gotta admit, he's pretty charming and cool, so I like him being here, even though it's at the cost of Casey. Like, goddamn, he kicks ass, look at him go! Otherwise, everything about this movie feels so tacked on to the first one in a way. It begins with Shredder dead, and then ends with Shredder dead. Nothing was learned or gained. The turtles don't really have any character arcs. There's like a vague attempt at one with them wanting to explore the outside world more, and then they get to have a party with some humans at the end, but it's just played as more of a gag than any kind of growth for them. And remember, go ninja, go ninja, go! I made another funny! <laughs> this story loosely adapts the storyline from the turtles lore where the secrets behind the mutagen are revealed. The titular secret of the ooze is that... Uh, it's just some industrial runoff chemicals. There's nothing really special about it in any way. They also get rid of almost all of it that still exists by the end of the first act. In the comic, the secret of the ooze is that it's like fuel for technology from a secret alien race that's stranded on Earth and living among us in disguise for decades and building a trans-dimensional teleporter to bring them back to their own home planet. Now that's a reveal! I wonder why Kevin and Peter dislike this one so much. Maybe it's because they removed the whole story from the story they were adapting? The second movie was a huge step backwards, and so we kind of ended up in square one with the third movie. The other big issue is the tone diverting from the first movie's maturity back to the 80s cartoon. It gives you a crazy whiplash when you watch them back to back. What was once dimly lit, dark and grainy is now colorful and warm lighting. Just the change in visuals alone makes this feel a lot less cinematic. The violence has also been dialed back, so the turtles never draw their weapons except for Donnie. You know, because he's got a stick. It's all gotten a lot more cartoonish and safe. The fight choreography is still really strong, but you can tell they're holding back and it hurts the movie. They're carrying deadly weapons getting surrounded by enemies, and they're choosing not to use them. Instead, they're surrounded by safer objects that can functionally work as the same as their weapons. Like, like Mikey hits you with sausages and yo-yos this time. Isn't that fun? Shredder gets his hands on the one last sample of mutagen in the world, and his big ambitions for them are to make two mutants that work for him. Not Bebop and Rocksteady, apparently Eastman and Laird fucking hate them, so we get Toka and Razar, who are even sillier and even dumber. Smart move, boys. Mama! Mama! We also have another character who helped create the mutagen at TGR... What? TGR... T... G... Huh? Who looks exactly like the cartoon version of Baxter Stockman, but isn't him? They gave him the bow tie and everything! Come on, guys, if you want this to be more like the cartoon, then why is it not Baxter, and why is this not Bebop and Rocksteady? You decided to ditch the Mirage stories in favor of the cartoon's contributions, but you didn't take anything from there either? Why is this movie filled with nothing? It wants to be sillier and crazier than the first one, but it doesn't want to go far enough because it doesn't want to bring in the wacky aliens or the comic relief villains. It's just a really droll and bland plot that doesn't commit to anything. It's all halfways. Also, what was the point of changing TCRI? 
What's the thought process there? Did they just want to be different but couldn't commit to actually making any decisions? TGRI Fridays. This movie just feels really empty and devoid of any creativity or passion. It's not offensively bad or anything. In fact, it's completely watchable, but it's just missing that secret sauce. That ooze, if you will, that makes it feel like an actual story worth being told. The costumes, fight scenes, and voice acting are all really strong, but everything else feels really weak. Even the final confrontation with Super Shredder at the end feels rushed and sweeped under the rug as quickly as they can. He's too physically strong for them to beat, so he just accidentally kills himself by being a big dumb bruiser and toppling a building onto his head. It's a really convenient, unexciting way to kill off your main villain, considering how intimidating he was in the first movie. J Jacob, Jacob wanted to write a part in here because we were writing this video together. He also drew some pictures for it. I hope you like his pictures. He drew some nice pictures. Now, as a big fan of the 80s Turtles and the Mirage Turtles, I feel like there's just a few changes that could have been made to make this movie a lot more palatable, especially coming off the first one. Imagine it this way. Replace these guys with these guys. That's it. But seriously, all you really need to do without writing an entirely new story is just keep Casey around since he fills the exact same role as Kino. He's the human friend of the Turtles who's always looking for a fight. Even Splinter is all like, chill the fuck out, man. Violence is the last resort. Like the whole time I was watching the intro of this movie, I was just thinking about how it'd be so much cooler to open with a reintroduction of these characters. Hey, uh, fellas. Uh, uh, Pizza's uh, here. Well, uh, what is this guy talking about? Uh, we guarantee an uh, ass kicking in 30 minutes or less. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, did we get your order wrong? Uh, Why don't you, uh, take it up with the managers? And if you want to keep Kino that bad, you can just have Casey jack the pizza delivery outfit from him, and then have him follow Casey and the Turtles back to April's place. Alternatively, the sentence, Jim Henson makes Utrams, could have made this worthwhile. TMNT 2, Secret of the Booze, is far from a terrible movie, but it's far from perfect. I don't agree with Eastman and Laird in their take that it's like the worst one. I think it has some redeeming qualities, and it wasn't too far from being a decent sequel. But I can see why they, as creators of the Turtles, disliked it so much. There's no story in the story, and it's a movie with an identity problem that can't decide if it wants to embrace the weirdness of the cartoon, or stick by the realism of the original film. So it's just really... like... nothing. But that movie still made money despite its problems, so they gotta do a third one! Hollywood's a business, kids. The poster for this movie tells you everything you need to know. They look fucking terrible. And there's a bad time travel gimmick! This movie doesn't even look like a real movie. This feels like a TV movie, all this high-key lighting illuminating just how cheap and bad the characters look now. It's so bright that they really look like rubber. The darker lighting of the original movie helped to hide the imperfections in the costumes. Now it's all so obvious and on full display. And these costumes are much worse. Instead of the Henson Company doing the suits for the Turtles this time, they outsourced it to a company that doesn't have a link on Wikipedia, so you know they were really prolific and professional. Instead of lively and believable marvels of practical effects that still hold up pretty well, the Turtles are now dead-eyed, lifeless, and robotic. Their eyes blink and react so rarely that they just feel like costumes. These voice actors are trying so damn hard to make this work. But the lip flaps look like garbage, there's no real attempt to match the mouths to the words, so they just look like robots chomping at the air while an imaginary voice from off-screen rambles over it. Ah, pizza. Got that, dude? Pizza. Ah, you guys are kids. You should be out, um... You, you should be out having fun. It's also a lot more obvious where the eye holes are, and I can't stop staring at it. It takes me out of the scene! I know his eyes are there! So remember that cool storyline from the comic? N no, you don't. I'll tell you about it. 
Renee, the Time Mistress, steals the scepter that lets you travel through time and goes on the run from an all-powerful cosmic entity named Lord Simultaneous and accidentally takes the turtles on an adventure through time. And they end up having to steal the Time Scepter back from a horned demon guy named Savanti Romero who lives in a big castle. Now, just imagine that, but like, without all the cool and interesting parts. So they just randomly find this Time Scepter by itself and April is sent back to feudal Japan by accident. She literally finds it off screen at a flea market before the movie even starts, and she brings it to their house. Also, the scepter switches you in time periods with someone else, and it switches your clothes, too. These guys should all be naked wearing shin and elbow pads. If you're going to establish this stupid rule, then stick to it. Corey Feldman is back as Donnie in this one, but his voice sounds a little bit more gravelly. Ironically, I think the way he sounds in this one might be better as a Leonardo voice. Whoa! Somebody's activated the scepter! We gotta go now! Raphael has been recast again, so he's had a different voice in all three movies. And Splinter's voice is different now because his original actor Kevin Clash was with the Jim Henson Company. The newer Splinter voice just isn't the same. He's mostly speaking in whispers and it doesn't command the same level of respect. Kenshin, you cannot go without the others. It would be cowardly. Should have gotten Mako to do it. Casey's back though. And he does nothing really useful the entire movie, but he's still funny and I missed him. Hey Ralph, how'd your brain implant go, good? What? Yeah. His role in the movie is to just watch over the five time displaced guys that April and the Turtles switch places with via time travel. And it has big Bill and Ted vibes because he's like taking them to the bar and then teaching them how to play hockey and- Hey! You got Casey Jones here? And you didn't let him wear the right hockey mask? Jesus. At least in this one, there's a little more going on with the characters than, like, nothing at all. Mikey and Raph start to enjoy being in feudal Japan because people sort of accept their existence there, and they're allowed to interact with humans and go out in the daytime. So at the end, they seriously consider just staying there and starting new lives since they're sick of being hidden in the streets of New York. Sure. Your home's a nice apartment. My home's a sewer. Uh, I've been thinking the same thing, Leo. People appreciate us here. But there's not really a reason for them to decide to go home. They just do it because Leo and Donnie say they should, and the conflict doesn't really get fleshed out as much as it could have been. For a movie called Turtles in Time, they really don't go to that many time periods. Especially after that kick-ass video game happened, and it's just... It's just a little lame. This one's been trashed to death, and for good reason, but I just find there's not much else to say. It's not really watchable, it's super cringy and embarrassing and tedious, and I don't think this movie should have been made. And I guess everyone else agreed because this one did not make Mad Bank like the first two. I'm sure there's someone who loved this movie when they were like, six. What started as a really honest attempt at adapting the comic devolved into robotically making these movies because they just needed to financially. The passion and love for the material exited pretty much right away, and I can understand why so many TMNT fans were frustrated with this trilogy growing up. It's before my time, yes, but I can still feel that growing disappointment as each installment passed. But thankfully, due to legacy sequels made decades later for no reason, this is not where this Turtles timeline ends, and we actually have a fourth movie. Hey, they got Mako! The TMNT 2007 movie wasn't necessarily marketed as the fourth film in the series, but a lot of little evidence adds up that it is. From subtle things, to overt references to previous entries in the quadrilogy, we can just accept that this is the last one. I really do want to advocate for more animated legacy sequels if they can't do live action ones. Kind of like those two Adam West Batman animated movies since he was too old to put the costume on. Make Ash vs. Evil Dead Season 4 as a cartoon, why not? But I really love the visual style of this film. The more dark and muted colors put me off as a kid, but today I appreciate just how unique this looked compared to so many other animated movies from the time. The turtles themselves had these exaggerated proportions that really look just like they did in the Mirage comics. I'd say the only thing I don't like is their giant square noses. Their eyes are a little too far apart and it just makes their faces unappealing. 
That's why I don't want any of the toys from this movie, because they're big stupid square noses. Aside from the turtles themselves, the environments look exactly as I'd expect Eastman and Laird's art style to look in 3D. The human characters aren't half bad either. Except for this one guy's... mouth sack. He's voiced by Kevin Smith. The cast has changed again, and I commend this movie for doing something that so rarely happens in theatrically released animated films. They got real voice actors! They didn't stunt cast some bullshit like Colin Dylan Sprouse as Donnie and Mikey or get something ridiculous like Master Splinter voiced by Brian Cranston doing an offensive accent. <laughs> this is Nolan North as Raph, James Arnold Taylor as Leo, Mikey Kelly as Mikey, and Mitchell Whitfield as Donnie. All these guys are professional VAs doing the voices for the main characters and not like names you've heard of that were famous for a sitcom or something. Remember when movies used to do that? Robin Williams was right to be weary of Disney. Genie ruined everything accidentally. If you think about it, Robin Williams' Genie is the reason why Mario sounds fucked up now. But the end result is that this movie looks and sounds like professional animation. This cast is so strong, and the celebrity voices that you'd expect, like Chris Evans as Casey, Sarah Michelle Gellar as April, and Patrick Stewart as the villain, they don't detract from the film either. They're all more normal and human characters, so more toned down vocal performances fit them well enough. While the more lively, expressive performances fit the turtles since they're these larger in life fantastical creatures with big dramatic emotions and scenes. And that's not to say the human voice actors aren't very expressive or anything, they're all great. Chris Evans especially surprised me. Before he was Captain America superstar Chris Evans, I feel like under the right circumstances, in the right time period, and with the right haircut, he could have been a good Casey Jones in live action too. Half the characters he's ever played are already almost that guy. Nolan North and James Arnold Taylor specifically elevate this movie so much with their portrayal of the complicated sibling relationship with Raph and Leo. The strongest components of the movie is Leo's story of leaving home for a year to train in South America, coming home to find that his absence has left his family in a lost and depressive state. The dramatic core comes from Raphael confronting Leo for leaving, having resented him for it and also their rivalry stemming from both wanting to be heroes in very different ways. Raphael becomes a vigilante and fights crime at night in sort of a superhero persona he's created for himself to hide from the rest of the family that he's sneaking out against Splinter's orders. When Leo finds out, he confronts Raph for being irresponsible and going out and intentionally looking for trouble. And it leads to the best fucking part of the movie. Don't do this, Raph. I'm done taking orders. Then there's also some bullshit about an ancient prophecy and five stone warriors and 13 monsters and a 3,000 year old knight and also cries there. And none of that stuff is very interesting or well thought out at all. This feels like one of the most incomplete scripts I've ever seen make it to the screen for a movie. This is 40% of a complete idea. It's like they wrote all the awesome Raph and Leo stuff first and then tried to come up with a whole movie to go around it, but didn't work nearly as hard on any of that stuff. Everything with the family struggling to move on without Leo is really interesting, and then the movie just goes on autopilot with everything else. Major plot elements feel like you could totally remove them and nothing would be different. Karai is there for what I assume is setting up Shredder's return in a planned sequel. Look, it's this concept art. He's on a poster. He would have been there. But not as a quick post-credits thing, she's in the entire movie and the turtles don't even really acknowledge she exists. Wow, well, good news is there's a bunch of foot ninjas getting the snot kicked out of them. Like, the Foot Clan is back in New York for the first time since the second movie with an entirely new leader. And the turtles don't even seem to care. They don't question if she's a friend or an ally. It's really weird. On top of that, five stone warriors and 13 monsters is too much shit to keep track of. Well, one of the warriors isn't stone, but his outfit looks so great, it may as well be. You can pick one or the other, but adding both of those factions of characters makes for 18 big gray villains that are hard to remember or care about. Like, yeah, great idea. There's been a discussion about big gray villains in recent years. So let's have a movie where there are 18 of these fucking guys. Literally made of stone, as gray as you can get. Like, sometimes I can't tell the difference between the stone knights or the monsters in fight scenes, 
because their designs are so indistinct and hard to quickly scan in combat. The plot is that this guy named something Winters opened a portal to the negative zone or whatever and it made him immortal but turned his best pals to stone and released 13 monsters into the world. Flash forward 3,000 years and his evil master plan is to undo the curse by capturing the 13 monsters, sending them back home, and allowing him and his stone homies to finally die. What are the downsides of this evil plan? Why is he the villain? Uh, the movie forgot to answer these questions, so he's kind of not even the villain, and this movie just has no antagonist, and the conflict doesn't even really involve the turtles until one of them gets mistaken for one of the 13 monsters. The turtles just sort of accidentally see all of this take place, and for the majority, they're just totally indifferent to everything. One of the stone generals tries to stop Winters and, like, keep them all from dying way too late into the movie, and those guys become antagonists to Winters, but not really to the Turtles. Like, they're not really there for any of this stuff. It's really dramatic and interesting when your main protagonist force are, like, kind of irrelevant to the things happening around them. This movie has a lot of really awesome scenes sprinkled throughout, some great art design and performances, but as a whole it just fits together really confusingly and it doesn't feel like a cohesive single idea. Just a bunch of random shit that happened all around the same time. Which is weird because it almost doesn't even really feel like a complete mess while you're watching it. Just kind of like the movie fell asleep at the wheel sometimes. TMNT 2007 has its problems, but it's still a massive spike in quality after the Turtles in Time movie. Part of me really just wishes this series of films had a more consistent look, tone, and cast. These voice casts have no consistency. And it gets even worse with the reboot films. Raphael has a different voice in five out of six movies. They only managed to keep the same one for both of the Michael Bay produced movies. And he didn't even like being there. Overall, I think the Turtles have had a much stronger run in TV animation. Sure, all the shows are really different, but I find all four of them super enjoyable and interesting in their own ways, and they all have these super dedicated fandoms. The movies start strong and then peter out really fast before a little heartbeat at the end. They struck hard and fumbled into the night. There was concept art for the sequel to the 2007 animated film that never came to fruition that looked interesting, but it seems there were other plans. The more Michael Bay style films are a whole other topic to cover, but let's end by looking forward to the new animated movie coming out from Invincible and the boys producer, Seth Rogen. I'm always open to reinventing the turtles in new ways, but part of me wishes the original storyline would get a more proper conclusion. It would be a legacy sequel to a legacy sequel if they ever revisited this continuity, so that ship has pretty much sailed, but you never know. Turtles have a way of persisting as a franchise no matter what happens. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Man, I, I love, love being a turtle. God, I love being a turtle! <laughs> Boy, do I love being a turtle. Oh, I love being a turtle.